The X-ray spectra is obtained when electrons at very high velocities impact a metal target. Before we get to the X-ray spectra, there are some prerequisite understanding or knowledge that is required and we will cover that first. Point number one, generation of electrons. In the lab, electrons can be generated using various methods. You have learned about one of them in the first part of this chapter called the photoelectric effect. This is where electromagnetic radiation impinging on a metal target with a frequency equal to or above that of a threshold frequency is able to kick out an electron from the surface of the metal target. Another important method would be by passing very high current through a filament, resulting in that filament reaching very high temperatures and kicking out electrons. This method of generating electrons using very high temperatures that is, using thermal means, is called thermionic emission. The therm here implying thermal means. Point number two, accelerating those electrons which we just generated. The electrons we have just generated has to be given a velocity. That is, they should be in motion, which means they should be given kinetic energy, which means we could do work on them and get them moving. We could apply a force on them and get them moving. When electrons are freshly generated, they do not process high velocities. Therefore, they have to be accelerated. To accelerate the electron, that is to give it a non-zero acceleration, thus a change in velocity, we place it in an electric field which is generated by applying a potential difference between two electrodes or plates. The electrons, obviously being negatively charged and within the electric field between the plates, will be acted upon by an electric force, a constant electric force towards the positive plate, hence will accelerate towards the positively charged electrode, that is the anode. The gain in the electron's kinetic energy is given by the work done by the constant electric force acting on that electron over a displacement. Mathematically, it is the integral FDS, that is, the area under the force displacement graph. And that simplifies to charge multiplied by potential difference between the point it started to where it ended, which in this case is the potential difference of the plates. We will do a much detailed study on this in another video. For now, this equation would do. Back to our electron generation device. We place a metal target for the electrons to accelerate towards to. We need to make that metal target positive. And we can achieve that by wiring the metal target to the positive terminal of the same high voltage source and that would make the metal target positive, that is becoming an anode. And an E field is now being set up between them, that is the filament and the metal target. The electrons upon generation will see a positive terminal and accelerate towards it. And that is because the electron experiences a constant electric force between it and the metal target. This would be a simple version of what is called an electron gun. Without the positive metal target, the electrons would have low or zero velocity and no particular direction of motion. With the metal target held positive, the electrons are now accelerate towards it with a high velocity and highly directed. Point number three, generation of photons by electrons. We will be learning two ways by which photons can be generated by electrons, both obviously based on the principle of conservation of energy. Firstly, by deceleration of electrons. When a high velocity electron is decelerated, that is slowed down, that loss in kinetic energy has to be converted to some other form of energy. In the case of the fast-moving electron being rapidly decelerated, it will lose its kinetic energy in the form of photon energy. The difference in the kinetic energy will equal the energy of the photon. And with a photon detector, we can obtain its frequency, thus wavelength. Let's look at three possible scenarios. 1. Suppose the electron with an initial kinetic energy got slowed down at an instant, that is, a single instance of slowing down or breaking, to a final kinetic energy, the difference between the final and the initial being negative, implying a loss, gets converted to a single photon of a particular frequency, thus a particular wavelength. Scenario number 2. It is also possible that the same electron may undergo subsequent instances of deceleration and thus produce photons of different frequencies, thus wavelengths, before eventually moving on with its final velocity or coming to a stop. Therefore, it is possible to get multiple photons of different frequencies, hence wavelength, from a single electron undergoing a sequence of rapid instantaneous decelerations, that is, a photon for each of the instances or episodes of slowing down. Scenario number three. This is a very particular situation and important in our analysis. In this scenario, the fast-moving electron undergoes a single episode or instance of rapid deceleration which results in its kinetic energy being completely converted to a single photon of a particular frequency thus wavelength. The electron is stopped and if this photon is detected it would be one of the highest frequency therefore lowest wavelength. Now let's consider the three scenarios together. If you have a collection of electrons with the same kinetic energy and were decelerated that is slowed down 
then the one that loses its kinetic energy completely at a single instance of deceleration gives off its energy as a single photon of highest photon energy. That then ties its frequency, its wavelength, hence photon energy, to the maximum possible kinetic energy that an electron had gained being accelerated in an E-field between the applied potential difference. Secondly, when electrons fall from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. We have learned that in an atom, electrons orbit the positively charged nucleus in shells of distinct energy levels, with the ground state near the nucleus and increasing potential with increasing radii. Energy level diagrams of atoms are usually numbered with their potentials given on their side. However, they could also be given letters. The lowest energy level, that is the first energy level, is assigned the letter K. The next energy level, that is the second energy level, is given L, the third is given M, and so on. If a vacancy is available in a lower shell or energy level, an electron from a higher energy level will fall into it. This is because electrons seek the lowest possible energy state to achieve stability. Based on the principle of conservation of energy, when an electron falls from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, that loss in potential energy will be given off as a single photon with that photon energy of a particular frequency hence wavelength. Point number four, the photon energy and graphing. The graph that we'll be looking at is a relative intensity versus wavelength. It's the graphical output of the photon detector and you can imagine the plot to be connected to it. Obviously, the wavelength axis would give the wavelength of the photons that it is detecting, which then becomes the x-axis data on the plot. As you move rightwards on the x-axis, the x-axis data, which is wavelength, increases. Knowing and using C equals F lambda, we can easily translate or convert the wavelength scale on the x-axis to a frequency scale and that would mean decreasing frequency as you move rightwards on the scale. That is because frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional from the wave speed equation. Using E equals HF which equals HC over lambda, you could also translate or convert the frequency or wavelength scale to an energy scale. With photon energy directly proportional to its frequency, frequency thus photon energy will increase leftwards along the x-axis. And with frequency decreasing as you move rightwards, so would photon energy. Low energy photons would have lower frequencies, thus higher wavelengths, while high energy photons will have higher frequencies, thus lower wavelengths. Point to note, suppose you are given photons with a range of wavelengths from lambda minimum to let's say lambda maximum and that minimum wavelength implies you have a maximum frequency, which is then the maximum photon energy. Keep this in mind, you will be needing this understanding later on. And on the vertical scale, we have relative intensity, which is basically the number of photons that corresponds to wavelengths hitting the detector. Do not confuse the word intensity here with energy or power of the photons. The energy of the photon given by E equals to HF is a function of frequency, thus also wavelength, and that is represented here on the horizontal axis, and we have just seen that. The word relative here gives an idea of how much more or how much less of energy, hence the number of photons that has been received compared to one of a different wavelength. For example, in this spectra, more photons of this wavelength, hence frequency, had been received by the detector compared to that received in this wavelength, hence frequency. The reason why this graph is called a spectrum is because you are plotting a parameter against the range of wavelengths or frequencies. Your detector is detecting the EM spectrum or part of it. And now, let's begin with the X-ray spectra. X-rays are produced when particles such as electrons impact a metal target at very high velocities. We need electrons, and that too at very high velocities, which means we need an electron generator and an accelerator, which basically means we need an electron gun. Before proceeding, let's upgrade the circuit we have here with one that resembles an actual X-ray generation system. The electrons generated by thermionic emission accelerated to high voltages in an E-field with a potential difference in the range of kilovolts are focused and made to hit a metal target. And on impact with the metal target, X-rays are emitted. With a photon detector in place, the shown spectrum is observed. The reason why this graph here is called the X-ray spectra is because the photons generated as a result of the electrons hitting the metal target falls into the X-ray part or band of the EM spectrum. Let's account for the features seen in this spectrum. You have the continuous band, the sharp lines called the characteristic lines, and the lambda minimum. We have learned that the detector picks up the wavelengths of the impinging photons and the relative number of those photons. Let's explain the continuous band. 
The target is a metal and it has its lattice structure. Made up of atoms, it has its positively charged nucleus and orbiting electrons. The high velocity negatively charged electrons on entering the metal target interacts with the dense positively charged nucleus and gets slowed down. This slowing down or breaking results in a loss of its kinetic energy which then leads to the generation of X-ray photons. Such radiation is called breaking radiation and in German, Bremsstrahlung. The gentle continuous band or part of the spectrum is due to the impacting electrons losing part of their kinetic energies into photon energy. The impacting electrons experience varying degree of slowing down that is breaking due to its interaction with the positively charged nucleus, therefore losing varying fractions or proportions of their kinetic energies in perhaps one or many instances of slowing down resulting in a continuous range of wavelengths such as described by scenario number 2 which we have seen earlier. The higher relative intensity in this region indicates that many electrons lose most of their kinetic energies instantly as higher energy higher frequency therefore lower wavelength photons. This point here, the photon with lambda minimum implying frequency maximum indicates maximum photon energy. And this maximum photon energy can only be obtained from an electron with maximum kinetic energy losing its kinetic energy in entirety in a single instant. And this maximum kinetic energy must have been acquired by the electron when it was accelerated in the E field. This ties the charge, the potential difference, the mass, velocity, frequency and wavelength in a grand series of equations made possible by the principle of conservation of energy as described by scenario number 3 which we have seen earlier. Next, the spikes which are called the characteristic lines. The peaks or spikes here indicates that photons of these wavelengths were much more abundant. This could only mean that the photons of these wavelengths were generated more in numbers. Based on the principle of conservation of energy, these photons must have come about from a loss in another form of energy and distinctly available in this setup. The source of these two distinct photons or wavelengths cannot be Bremsstrahlung or breaking. How can breaking resulting in a loss of kinetic energy be so precise and frequent? Should it not have variation? And we have used that as a point to explain the continuous curve. These spikes therefore must be intrinsic. That is unique to this target material and let's look at how that must have happened. An incoming high-speed electron could knock out one of the orbiting electrons and in this example it knocks off a K-shell electron which is an electron from the first energy level. This results in a K-shell vacancy. An electron from a higher energy level, such as one from just one level above, that is the L-shell, can fall into the K-shell vacancy. And in that process, emit a photon whose energy is equal to that electron's loss in potential. These photons give rise to the K-alpha emissions. It is also possible that the high-speed electron knocks out a K-shell electron and the vacancy is being filled by an electron falling from the M-shell, that is from two energy levels above the K-shell. These photons give rise to the K-beta emissions. With a greater loss in potential, therefore a higher energy photon, implying higher frequency, implying a lower wavelength, this spike here must be the K-beta. And the second one here of higher wavelength, lower frequency, thus lower energy, implying a smaller energy transition, must be the K-alpha. These K-shell emissions are distinct wavelengths and therefore distinct and unique to the metal target. If the energy levels in the atoms of a particular element tend to be unique, then the transitions by the electrons are unique. And this pattern here would be unique and therefore distinct to the target material. It is also possible that the incoming high velocity electron knocks off an orbiting electron from any of the other shells such as the L and M shell, resulting in L and M shell vacancies respectively. In such cases, electrons from higher energy levels will fall in and fill in the generated vacancies, generating photons which are then detected as corresponding L and M shell spikes on the spectra. However, there is far greater interest in the K shell emission and besides, depending on the element, some of the emissions hence spikes may not fall into the X-ray part of the spectrum, hence ignored. This concludes our lesson on the X-ray spectra. Do check out the Q&A video on this topic, it may answer some of your doubts and questions and give you better understanding of this topic.